Hi, welcome. My name is Nikolai Stange, and I'm working as a live patching developer at SUSE. And this talk will be about a little side project I've been doing recently. So at SUSE, we do source-based um, live patches, which as opposed to, for example, binary diffing-based methods. And the problem is that this is a completely manual process at this time. So what is involved is usually to find out which functions have to be patched and then just to recursively copy everything together from the original um, kernel sources into, into the live patching module sources. So and yeah, that's a tedious process and it's a lot of work, it, particularly if you support like for example 60 different kernel versions or so. And so yeah, I've been working on uh, automating that. Um, let me show my single slide. So the overall approach is to basically implement, oh, it's, that's sad. It. It's cut off. <laughs> okay, but I think I remember what, what it was. So the overall approach is to basically write kind of a C front end, and it works like this. In the first steps, there's a pre-processing uh, phase, and the important thing is that for each pre-processing token, which could be something like an identifier or white space or anything, um, it tracks the um, expansion history, which will be important in the very last step when it will attempt to undo the pre-processing to keep the result as close to the original kernel sources as possible just for reviewability and everything. So in the second step, ah, by the way, the check marks are for what's working. <laughs> so um, in the second step, yeah, just parse that pre-processor token thing. Um, and then we are running a full type evaluation. And this is important to know which type definitions are actually needed in the uh, create a live patching module. So, um, yeah, in the fourth step, we build the closure, which just means we copy everything needed um, together, automated, and yeah, I have a toy demo for that. Um, yeah, and in the fifth step, that's the last one, which is slightly cut off, uh, will be doing the, undoing the pre-processing, and yeah, I haven't implemented that yet. Other questions? Or? Ah, it's from the other room. So, let me show you a quick demo. Um, okay, this, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Is it visible or? Okay, it's not. So, sorry. It's, it's fine, it's the last thing to show. So, this is just an example toy input featuring several things like arrays and functions. The ext, ext prefix is for just just for the toy demo to indicate that we'd like to have it externalized, or I don't know a better word for it, but um, basically to prepare that for being convertible into a KLP relocation. So, and for the arrays, it's important to, when it comes to externalization, we, for example, have to remove the initializers because you just can't have extern symbols with uh, initializers. Yeah, so, uh, one thing to highlight is that uh, for one array, uh, the first one, the size will be needed, and I think for the others, not. So and let me run this then. So and please ignore any white space issues. Yeah, as you can see, or can't see. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let me pipe that to less. So. Okay. 
So it's actually um, explicited, uh, emitted the size of this first array, which was needed, left it out for the second array, which, um, because it's just not needed, and kept the initializer for the uh, non-externalized third array. Yeah, and when it comes to functions, it's, yeah, just either uh, resolve it to an external or not. So one more thing is that if the one of the patched functions or any functions which are in the closure um, are referenced by some expression which is not a function call, it should also get externalized to just keep the, um, to retain the original address from the kernel code version. Yeah. Yeah, and I have a second demo which is about, yeah, just structures and types, but I'll skip that, I think. Um, other questions, remarks, everything's welcome to make that thing usable for other people too. Maybe I would like to ask, uh, do you have some estimation how far you are, like if you yeah. have done like 40% uh, of the needed work to get it uh, usable? Yeah, so I think, I mean there can be always be problems <laughs> in, yeah. in sure. the way, but I think it's something like 80 to 90% because the most work was to do the type evaluation in a way compatible with GCC. So yeah, but yeah, th I'm I'm um, running this, this this type evaluation thing on the GCC test suite, so I'm quite optimistic that it will work. So it and it passes. <laughs> so yeah. So that sounds promising. I hope. <laughs> Any more questions or? Okay, so, so maybe just a step back because I think it should be mentioned that we would like to have something like, the, oh, maybe not exactly like this, but to have a fetch creation to upstream, just to have something, I, I, am I right? Uh, so that w we want to have some fetch creation to upstream. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, so because it, to, do ev to do everything manually is, is is a horrendous task. So uh, any automation is, is is perfect. So the question is whether this source-based approach is, is the way to go. That, that's the first question because you you, you have a well function in demo uh, to some extent. So th that's first question. We need to decide if we haven't decided yet. I'm not sure. Uh, because then there's k-patch build, of course, so <coughs> the question is whether to use that or just to, f to follow this path. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think we're in a position to make that deci decision yet because of the GCC optimization issue. Um, I do think if, which we'll talk about next, mm. but I, I do think um, if we resolve that problem and you know this works end to end then we could be a you know good candidate for replacing kpatch build so I, I do like this the idea of the source based approach um, how it works in practice is still you know remains to be seen but um, I think it's promising at least yeah uh, I have one more question uh, do you think that this uh, tool will be able to also catch, for example, semantic changes in that uh, uh, source code that needs special care, like using shadow variables? Yeah, and we and that would definitely stuff. be the second step to just verify to some extent possible that you're not doing anything which is like forbidden in live patching. So I mean, the, the low hanging fruit would be to check that you're not modifying structs or something. But beyond that, I can imagine even more complicated things like 
For example, if we add something like a control flow gra graph, which was not be that hard, we could, for example, detect um, locking inversion or something like that. But yeah, it's just basically, yeah, it's the second step or third step. Yeah. Okay, another thing. So, uh, because I think Alice yesterday talked about relocations and how to generate them, right? Am I right? Yeah. Do I remember? No, okay. Uh, so, uh, and you talked about relocations. And so I'm going back to KLP Convert. Uh, so given that GCC optimizations problem is solved, which is about to be, uh, so should we should we use KLP convert with this approach? Because there may be another another way how to do it. This is not my idea because it, it comes from Michael Mats uh, from our GCC team. So because I think I didn't refresh it, but his idea was that uh, you don't have to have special elf sections for for our purpose. Uh, because we could, since since a life patch is tightly bound to to its kernel, so we know where all the symbols are up to K S A S L R, but that could be solved as well. Uh, so we could generate all all the relocations just just like that because we 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 know the kernel, and that. Uh, KS ASLR could be solved by relative relocation. So those could don't have to be absolute, but relative to some well-known symbol in, in, in the kernel. So in that case, KLP convert and everything we have right now in upstream uh, for the relocations uh, would, be, would be obsolete. So that may be an idea. So Yes, yes, right, but it should be much, much simpler. Oh, yeah. Well, what about export extended? I, I mean, <laughs> turn, currently you can only link to export extended, right? Yes. So you would have to figure out how to circumvent that. Uh, yeah. Um, I think the biggest obstacle to that is um, exported symbols are currently the only way to link to a symbol from a module is if it's exported. There was a talk that talked about doing individual function relocation for security reasons. So we don't necessarily want to prevent that with assumed optimization. That, that was. Uh, I don't think I can comment on that, but I don't think life path should come in the way of being able to do that. So, uh, if I understand, uh, you're speaking about the randomization <laughs> talk, right? Where uh, the suggestion was to use f function section. So I am not really sure if we really want to do that for the kernel, I mean, the basic kernel as such, and boot something with that kind of, I'm not sure, I'm like, is that even feasible to do? <coughs> the kernel can kernel architect the kernel section. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think kernel architect was only using oh. oh, sorry, I was not aware of that. So what problems remain after this with respect to being able to do a source-based patch? Um, Sorry, I think the mic isn't really working. Although it okay. is. Uh, what problems remain with respect to being able to do a source-level patch as opposed to like a binary diff uh, that kpatch does after your GCC changes? So I don't understand what the question. Are the remaining problems yeah. After yeah, basically none. So I mean, you I mean, you, 
the, the problem is you always have to inspect the upstream fix manually if it's suitable for live patching. So you always need some human probably or some M AI, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, that's so I and I think when, when when we have that we'll be very happy. Or I will be very happy because I won't have to do it manually anymore, but yeah. Fair point. Any more questions or shall we continue with the next yeah, session? Uh, it's an obvious thing, but how, how do you plan to, to generate the list of patched functions? So, so you're going to parse the, the, the patch. I okay, so and this is why this is a toy demo, because it decided that based on the name of the input. And for the pr um, production thing, I'm thinking about having a command like taking like user provided shell commands that could be decide like, is this external Externalize a or so, which would probably uh, the shell command, which probably just runs an object dump with grab on the target kernel or something like that. And yeah, so and I hope that um, by um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm asking because it should be somehow connected uh, in a pipeline with what we get or what we will get from GCC uh, dump. Uh, about how optimiza optimizations are involved and in lining. Yeah, and right. So, yeah. so, yeah, right. So, um, okay, I, I actually have a slide for that, although I'm forbidden to have <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the command line interface I had in my mind. So it doesn't exist yet, but what I'm what what basically is needed is a, is a number of policy decisions, which is like. Um, is, is some function in the initial set. Uh, for example, functions in the closure should be remain, renamed probably, and so on. And one, one of the, or two of the policy is whether or not um, uh, functions can be externalized. And for example, this can externalize command would inspect the, um, the output as the optimization um, report as generated by GCC, for example. So yeah. And yeah, f yeah. A FD is for a function definition, so it's different, a little bit different between function definitions and function declaration or data declarations. Uh, are these patches anywhere? Or do you plan to post this, these patches? I mean, it's not a patch, it's like 41,000 lines of code, well, but I can <laughs> post <laughs> Okay. I mean, maybe I not a patch, it. but a, a Git repository. <laughs> so, yeah, I can, I can okay. probably push it somewhere. I don't, I have to, yeah. I mean, the, the source based approach is, is very new to me personally, so I would like, would like some time to look at it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. But, yeah, really, as a front end, only the toy thing exists yet. So yeah. There's no question. Hey, um, perhaps you just covered this, but uh, I wasn't sure um, if the tool helps <laughs> with uh, inline functions. Um, I'm also very new to the, that source-based approach, and I wasn't sure. You know, you had that example where you had a, a patched function. What would happen if you wanted to patch a, a function that Compiler typically okay. inline. Yeah, I know. So this is all I was talking all about the recursive. I mean, it assumes that it's known which functions are patched, which means it's right now, or even when this is ready, is a manual process. But um, what I'm planning to do is to basically give the tool a diff and go the um, call graph up until it has found something that is readable for being a live patching target, and then does this recursive thing. But that's made pretty trivial to implement to go just up the call, yeah. call graph while this, um, this recursive completion of uh, building of the closure is not because, you, because of the type evaluation which is needed. So, but yeah, it's yeah, good question.
Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm Miroslav. I work at SUSE on live patching, and so this is my, my just one slide. And, and it's not so important, because first I apologize. This is not going to be much about discussion, I think, because many things have happened uh, recently. So maybe more like status report. So uh, I, I talked about GCC optimizations and, and live patching two years ago in Santa Fe, and so there are, GCC, uh, there are GCC optimizations which are quite dangerous for live patching uh, because GCC is allowed to do some, some crazy stuff uh, with, with the code. Uh, for example, it, it, it can remove parameters of a function if those parameters are not evolved, involved, uh, which means that there are constants during, during the runtime and and stuff like that. So uh, it would be great to do something about it because, for example, that source-based automation creation tool uh, would need to be sure that everything, uh, which every symbol or every function which can be found in, in the kernel and can be called somehow from, from the live patch module is, is safe to call. So it's it's because when you when you live patch a function, it can it, it can change somehow. GCC would do something different with it. For example, those parameters would would be used suddenly. So if you if, if you call such such an optimized function, it could it could crash your kernel. <coughs> uh, the problem is that sometimes GCC lets you know that it did something to a function. So it when it clones a function, uh, it usually uh, add a suffix to that symbol name. So you, you can find, in your call same stable, you can find functions like foo dot const prop dot some number or dot uh, isra dot a number and stuff like that. So at least you know from, from the function name that something was done on that function which is good because then you can go back in a call graph and, and live patch it, its caller, which is, which, which is great. But sometimes uh, GCC doesn't let you know that it, done, that it had done something about, about, about a function. Uh, so it's quite hard to, to notice it. Of course, you could analyze uh, the object file and then you, you could see that some, something happened but that's, that's not, not much comfortable. So it, we, I think we came to a conclusion that it would be great to disable such optimizations. Well, it's not always possible, uh, as we found out recently, uh, because not all of these optimizations, uh, not all, yeah, not all these optimizations uh, can, be, can be disabled. Uh, so that, that's one thing, and there's no, uh, how to say that? So it would be quite, maybe uh, quite uncomfortable from the maintenance point of view to uh, get a track of those dangerous optimizations. So because GCC evolves quite a lot, so with every major version there are new optimizations, so we, would have to be careful about it to let know, to know the new to know that 
new optimizations are somehow dangerous. So it would be better to have a one option which would disable what's necessary and let GCC guys care about it. And it turned out uh, a month ago that Oracle uh, wants to do the same. So there was a proposal on, on GCC mailing list uh, to do something quite similar. It's, it's not about kernel live patching because they want it for user space. But then again, it's similar because they want to uh, disable uh, first those dangerous GCC optimizations, but then they, they want to limit the inlining as well, which we don't want to, I think. So that's one question, maybe for a discussion, because that could impact performance quite, quite a lot. Uh, so this proposal evolved uh, in, in, in a time, and uh, we came up with quite, quite a simple proposal. So let's implement uh, disabling switches for those optimizations which we cannot in, uh, disable right now. So that's one thing. Uh, let's, let's have a new, new option which would disable everything what's, what's dangerous. Uh, this is maybe a walk around because if we had a complete view of impacted functions in, in the kernel, I, I mean, which functions were impacted by GCC optimizations. It would not be necessary to disable those optimizations sometimes, or n not, not always, because you, you would just patch that, that closure, but that one can be quite huge. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, so do we actually have a clear definition what exactly it is the dangerous optimization? Yeah, so <coughs> everything which somehow, every optimization which somehow modifies CABI, whatever it means. So, so there's, there's optimization which is called IPA, RA, register allocation. It could modify CABI because GCC knows that a function is a leap function, not, not all of sure, those sure, registers. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's clear. I mean, yeah. if there is anything else besides the clearly ABI violating uh, optimizations. Yeah. Uh, so if there are other things we would like to disable other than everything yeah, so, that touches so ABI. I, I think it, all, all of this uh, code removing, or that's code removing optimizations, uh, variable removals, all of this stuff. Right. Or, because, or just GCC can decide that a global variable is, is read-only, and then it just does stuff to the uh, code. And, and the GCC people are fine with ha introducing such a switch that would disable all this, right? Yes. Interesting, okay, good. Oh, <laughs> to, to my knowledge, they are. <laughs> I missed some of the talk, but is there a specific set of functions where these optimizations occur? Are they largely static functions, or is GCC doing uh, optimization across a bunch of dotos? Uh, is it doing uh, optimization across all the functions? Like no, no, no. It's all of this are IPA, which means interprocedural uh, something. Okay. So it's only in, in, in one, one unit, I think. Uh, yes. Okay. So just static functions, right? Because we don't have LTO in the kernel. Okay. Enabled still. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, uh, and the second part of the proposal was about dumping in info about impacted functions. So, uh, currently, there is uh, an option in, in GCC uh, which lets you know uh, what GCC did in terms of cloning. So, if, if, if a function was cloned, uh, it will it will dump the info. We have a tool to pass it, so we know that a function was inlined to to its caller. Uh, we know that those IPA optimizations were used, so that gives us optimi uh, gives us overview uh, about the set about that closure about the set of to be patched functions. Uh, Oracle wants, or that guy from Oracle wants some something more. Uh, 
Uh, so th there is probably going to be a new, new option which would give info or which would give info about about all the impacted functions so somehow I, I don't know it wasn't specified yet so that's just an idea and last point you you may wonder uh, about performance impact because when you when you disable GC optimizations you just somehow have a feeling that it it's maybe not a good idea to do well the kernel is is special in, in this way. It's not C++ templates uh, code, so it's highly optimized. Uh, so we found out, uh, thanks to Giovanni Gerdovic from our performance team, that the, the impact is not that sig significant. Uh, I think in majority of cases, uh, there was no impact at all. Uh, there are some cases we when there was an impact, but it was in terms of in order of percents, so nothing nothing significant. Uh, uh, we tested it on, on, on a big machine, on, on a small machine, and the results were quite consistent. If you, if you want to say more, you, you, you can, of course. Yeah, so uh, the, the conclusion is, uh, does this all make sense? I, I think it does, so we want to disable uh, everything which is dangerous and we cannot do anything about it. And so I imagine that once this lands in GCC upstream, which could be GCC 10, I suppose, because GCC 9 is about to be, to be stabilized, I think, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know for sure. So GCC 10 would, would be our target, and then we can have, a, have an option in, in the kernel just to, just to just do it. So questions? Where is the cube? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so first of all, GCC 9 is now frozen for major features. Yeah, I thought so. so uh, yeah. The second is that just to clarify that the performance measurement was only x86, or was it other ISAs and architectures. Yes, it was x86, right. So there may be impacts of optimization that, that differ between architectures. Could be, could be, yes. So, so I presume these optimizations will be enabled for config live patch? Yes. Okay. I w uh, is it easier to get a new optimization level with minus OL or something that says? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so I, yeah. So back to what I what I said before. I, I think we need, or we would like to preserve inlining. I think that's crucial uh, in, in the kernel. We didn't measure it because it somehow seemed uh, ridiculous to even try. And uh, in the absence of, even in the absence of that flag, is it possible to somehow uh, figure out that these functions are dangerous so that? If they are never live patched, then we still get all the benefits that we need. Um, or if we try to live patch them and they were not necessarily compiled with the right optimizations, we can fail the live patch. I probably did not understand the question. Uh, I think what you're doing today yeah. is like can you detect when these optimizations have already occurred? So what, what, what we do is that, uh, let me be honest, I, I know it's recorded, but well, okay. Uh, so what, what we do is that uh, we deal with those uh, IPA optimizations because of those suffixes and function names. So we, we know what, what happened. Uh, then in such cases, we, we patch all the callers. Uh, about those other dangerous optimizations, we just pretend that everything is all right. Uh, there's important remark to it because I think all of these optimizations would be called uh, during the testing, which is important by itself. So yeah, so this is important, really. Oh, uh, another question, Joe. Um, so, um, 
having the ability to disable um, the set of optimization is probably most useful for us. Um, this may be a far-fetched idea, but if you are given a list of optimizations that occurred for given functions, would it be possible to instruct GCC to do those same optimizations for the patched compilation? Um, and would that be safe? Or would it require too much sort of you know, analysis to make sure that you know, you're yeah, adding I, new code? Is it even yeah, apples I, to I, apples? I, I, yes, but it, some of these optimizations uh, would be useless in, in that case. And it might uh, not be even generally possible, I think. Okay. If, if we are talking about re, re num, uh, renaming registers and the new code would li look completely different, there's no way how to map, yeah. n map the two codes together, right? If, if the change to the function is significant. But maybe there was a subset of those elements <laughs> that could be safe. Yeah, yeah, probably, but maybe that subset is of zero size. Too. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, okay, so so going back to n to Nikolai's talk, so my my vision of all the pi pipeline is that we somehow uh, make GCC compilation safe for for the life for conf config live patch. Then we get info from GCC what's in line where, for example. Then there's going to be your your tool then we could do something about the relocations and that's it. Am I right? Sounds reasonable. Okay, so, so now we have to do it. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I'm uh, now talking about something which I, in lack of a better name, um, coined uh, global consistency. And it's, it's referring to the period in time when the live patch has been fully applied, which means the transition to it has finished and the transition away hasn't been started yet. And in that time, you basically know that the whole kernel is patched completely, um, and this allows one to do some advanced things from a live patching perspective, like um, changing global semantics. Um, yeah, still in the works. <laughs> okay. Pardon? Don't get that. Great. You can use whiteboards. Yeah, I, I think I can describe it as well. So, um, usually, for example, take L1TF. So, you have this, um, this PDE, and, and the fix is to invert the higher bits, basically. And on x86, there are some unused bits, which means that for inverted PDEs, you would always have the highest bit set, and um, for
for non-inverted PTEs, it would be unset. So basically, it would enable the live patch functions, the, the reader function, which is something like PTE to swap entry, I guess, um, would be able to um, handle either case. And when it is known that um, there is no unlive patched PDE to um, swap entry, then it's actually possible to do that. So and the idea was to um, kind of use callbacks, like um, for example, the post patch callback, I think it's in upstream. Um, that would just set some global Boolean flag, a glo global for the live patching module, and enable the PDE writers to actually start inverting PDEs. So um, that worked very well. So the problem is, or not a real problem, but what has to be solved is when it comes to either reverts, because basically what has to be done is a revert. OK, that's apparently not mine. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> Let me try. So there we go. Yeah, okay. So that's the idea to 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 uh, set a global flag from the post patch callback, which would enable the writers to start, for example, inverted uh, PDEs. Um, the problem is when it comes to either reverts or to downgrades to uh, application of, of a next live patch module, which is actually a downgrade and doesn't have the L1TF fix, because that means that um, the um, PDE to swap entries may perhaps be unpatched now on, and thus enabled to cope with the inverted uh, um, PDEs, which would mean the system would just crash. So we have to, from, for example, from the pre unpatch callback, which will be, I think, yeah, no, forget about that. We have to scan all page tables and block the transitions to start. So, and it turned out to be quite a useful technique, if you want, um, for example, for Meltdown and L1TF. And what I'm wondering about is whether it would make sense to introduce some um, API for like informing the live patch about that it's in global consistency mode or something like that. And yeah, the, the, the most difficult thing about this, so we've been discussing that internally a little bit, and basically what we think, if we want to do that, we would probably have some kind of IDs, like, like IDs for fixes, like one, we would allocate one ID, for example, for L1TF. So, and then we would have some sense of um, the state is maintained or broken or whatnot. So, and yeah, that's the topic to discuss. So first, whether it would make sense, so or if it was it, and second, if there are any ideas for a sane API for that. Yeah, so my idea was uh, like to create something like uh, we have that API for shadow variables that would be able to uh, get, uh, allocate some structure where it could store, for example, pointer dot, uh, for callbacks and maybe, I don't know, some version number of that, what, what's the uh, state and I don't know, maybe some other flags or whatever. And then uh, we could use basically the existing callbacks to keep it simple. And then we could from there call uh, just some get function. And if the state already exists, then we could have easy access to uh, the callbacks <laughs> from the old patch. So if we somehow, for example, need to uh, revert uh, the uh, operation uh, before we uh, apply the new patch, then we could easily call the callback from the old patch and, and so on. And uh, 
or we could just do nothing because we are able to basically just maybe t- uh, check the version and we uh, knew that the new patch uh, exactly handled the same uh, feature the same way so there will be no change and we could just uh, do nothing and stuff like this and but it somehow expects that which is the current uh, proposal in the atomic replace uh, patch set that uh, we will call just the callbacks from the new patch the idea is that actually only the new patch knows what uh, what might have been in the older patches and how to like take over or uh, revert or change uh, uh, the state or disable what's not longer needed and, and stuff like this. And yeah, the only problem is with uh, downgrades of patches because uh, we are currently not able like uh, to prevent users for uh, installing older version of the patch and given if we use that uh, atomic replace approach then uh, if we install the old patch on top of the new one then it will basically like the old patch replace the new one but the old patch doesn't know it it was prepared before and he doesn't know so i thought about that i i don't know we might either add some like versioning into the live patching and actually the kernel will refuse to load old patch or maybe we could uh, just check if the uh, if the patches support the same set of features like that we could be aware of all that uh, global states and check that the versions are the same or something like this so that basically the patches are compatible but it still might be dangerous because actually it's how the patches are created if you introduce new uh, feature then you could test just the transition between the state between the old patch that didn't support it and uh, to newly support it and when you do the next version of the patch then you could finally test correctly the transition and you might actually find that it doesn't work well and you have to somehow update the code and, and so on so yeah <laughs> okay so first i'm sorry for, for you guys because this must be pretty confusing but uh Okay, so I think <laughs> <laughs> the important question is uh, to ask whether we even want to support that scenario when you apply all the patch to, 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 to the newer one. Um. Because I don't know. It sounds somehow wrong. <coughs> yeah, we, yeah I, I mean, because that, that's uh, one case is when you, when you want to go back, so you, you want I don't know, for example, you have two, two patches applied and then you want to revert the, the, the newer and the other one would stay, is it still supported? I, I, it would be better. Would this scenario be supported with your atomic replace patch, patch set or not? Yeah. So that you have two, two patches applied and uh, you could remove or revert the newer one to, so only the older one would stay. No, I don't think so. No. I think that's no. that's something something we decided not to do, right? So, okay. So then, then it may it may make sense to to support what that problematic scenario you you described. Yeah, yeah. W- well, there is some workaround, and I wonder if it might be acceptable that we, if we keep the possibility to disable the patch, then the users that would like to downgrade could disable the new patch, then for some time the uh, system will be non unpatched and they then they could install the older patch and like get it's like downgrade with, with something about but it's yeah. like mm-hmm. yeah. yeah but just I, I think we, we don't want to do this because uh, as you said the system would be unpatched e- even for a short short period of time. And the whole point of atomic replace is not not to have it. So that that the system is is 
yeah. fully fetched. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm yeah. not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I just w wonder how many times it, it's needed because it doesn't make sense to, like, I think that it might be pretty complicated to support downgrades <laughs> like a safe way. And for example, uh, Nikolai has had an idea to add a lot of like new callbacks that, uh, for example, that the global state ha might have some uh, states where the new patch could be transferred to a new one and uh, a rollback and, and a lot of callbacks <laughs> to do all these uh, changes. And but for me, it looked very complicated and I had like troubles to make a mental picture of how the all, all the callbacks depends on each other and in which order they are called and yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I still think that it doesn't make sense to complicate it that much if it's used just, I don't know. Uh, so I think maybe the obvious first step is not, mm, we, can, we can disallow it. So that if, if there was a case that if you went from the new one, so or if you applied the older patch to, to a new one, so if there's a way that that in 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 the framework, so if there's a way to detect such scenarios, so I think uh, with those IDs it could could be done. So even the older patch could know that there's something in a global state machinery that the older patch cannot deal with. So if, if this can be done, so I think the simplest way, uh, simplest thing is to, to, refuse, to refuse such downgrade. So this is something we can, we can start from. And I would generally have something simpler at the beginning and then we can, we can add stuff because this is really useful, not, not for all those Common, common CV fixes and stuff, but if something like Meltdown or L1TF uh, came in the future, it would be it would be perfect. Yeah, so you're saying that each KLP patch structure would basically announce some set of state IDs it relies on? Yes. Okay. That could be just a single ver number. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think, well, no, I, no, I, I, I mean, yeah. So yeah. Like, like you said, L1 TF, oh, and yeah. if the older older patch does not contain a L1 TF fix, it would know that well. There is something I don't know. So yeah. You, um, you could also use shadow variables. Yeah. You wouldn't even need an API, right? Mm. You just yeah, right. create your own scheme, whatever it is. Mm. The question would be, should we allow this? So uh, the ID should be generated by us, or we allow the user to know, choose his own ID kind of thing. That would be like, <laughs> if if you're going to allow the user as such for the downgrade also, he can use the same thing. And uh, that can be like a workaround or cheat around if the ID can be like predicted. Should we have like, the, the ID should be generated by the light patch system itself? Or the user should get? I think you need the, the uh, Or like, I, I don't know. Some upgrades might not update the global state, right? So they would, if you did that, the, the version would be the same as before, or the identifier would be the same as before. So. And there was also another related idea that actually Nikolai came with, uh, that somehow it's like maybe uh, ugly that uh, all these callbacks and maybe the state is associated with module or with object because uh, and actually I uh, we, we thought about it that it might be easier from the maintenance point like uh, have just like another list of array of, of this like states and uh, have like separated callbacks for each state or something like this so just of course, it's possible like to uh, do some top level 
callback like pre and pause and coach uh, call all that callbacks from there, but it, it's just... Uh, well, well I, I don't know because, you not usually, but I think that callbacks are tied to to object in a way because you you manipulate with something which is in that object via via the callback. So if it's I don't know a global variable you, you'd like to change, say that lives somewhere. It's it, 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 it's an object file. Uh, so no, not object file. That parent object, but it. So it. So I don't know if. Seems like orthogonal, so I, I don't know whether to go this way. I mean, um, uh, I just recognized, I think, this morning or something, that these um, callbacks not tied to any particular object can actually be emulated by using the callbacks for VM Linux. And so, yes. So, yes, yeah, so, yeah, okay, right. Any more questions? So thank you very much. Uh, okay, so hello everyone, I'm Joel. I work for SUSE, as you can see. Uh, I will excuse first, because I have more than one slide. So I'm sorry about that, but it's gonna be fast. I, I swear it's gonna be fast. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about libpulp, which is uh, our presentation on uh, user space live patching. So uh, just like, uh, sort of like new thing. So because of that, I actually need these extra slides, otherwise I would not be able to go a little bit in detail about what we have to talk about. So the first thing we have to say is that uh, we don't have a reliable stack tracer for user space. So it's kind of complicated to use this approach to have live patching uh, in user space. Also, whenever you're running uh, your program, the threads are not only in kernel space. So you could not use the old approach from KeyGraph for also having uh, user space live patching. So we actually needed to find a different uh, idea for dealing with this. and. Uh, our idea came from the assumptions that actually live patching the binary uh, main object is not really the goal, because normally the, the uh, vulnerabilities or, or the, the bugs you have in your code are residing inside libraries. So for example, glibc and libssl. So uh, we just relaxed our, our uh, goal a little bit and we said, okay, if we're able to patch uh, libraries, this might be enough. So basically we created this model that we call a uh, library boundary based patching, which is more or less like the old approach from KGraph, but instead of like tra tracking the context uh, from user space to kernel space, we're actually tracking the context, the context from uh, the main object to the library, uh, to the library binary. So uh, how does it work? So first thing we do, 
uh, we do some changes to the symbol table. So basically, uh, we take the binary, we change the values wi within the symbol table so we can actually point uh, to a trampoline table. So basically, we are redirecting the entry points for a library. And uh, we want to do that because we want to make the control flow to go through our stubs. So we call it like ULP stubs, and we'll get into detail about this uh, soon. Uh, we also do a little change the linker in the case we implemented this in LD. And uh, basically, we, we generate a trampoline table uh, within the linker. So we have this table there with uh, one entry for each exported symbol. And uh, we also have uh, compiler changes, which are pretty much similar to the whatever is, is being done for uh, kernel, li kernel live patching, where uh, we emit uh, padding ops into function prologs. So uh, in the end, uh, we, we, we have this, uh, this schematic. Uh, so basically, if you think about the main, uh, I'll just, we'll go through uh, the graph so you can understand how it works. Uh, if you go through main, uh, whenever you're calling a function called foo, which is in a library that you actually want to live patch, what you do is that you try to resolve that symbol. Uh, so you go through the PLT, you leave this uh, work for the dynamic linker, and uh, it's, it's resolved to the trampoline table. So basically, the trampoline table will have this uh, TRM entry for the function foo. And uh, inside the trampoline table, we are actually calling a function, a stub, that we call the ULP entry. And here's actually uh, the trick that we are doing. So in the ULP entry, what you're going to do is that first you're going to check if there's, a fun uh, if there's a variable called shadow, which is set. If that's set, uh, this means that the library was already entered. So we don't care about it. I mean, we already know that we cannot patch this library because it's already running. But if it's not set, this means that the library is being entered for the first time. So here what we do is that uh, we save the return address for the function that we want to call, that, 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 that's actually being called. We replace the return address uh, in the stack uh, with the address for uh, ULP exit, which is another stub from us. And uh, then we check if there's a pending patch. So if there's a pending patch, if we actually want to patch something, we are going to apply the patch right now. So the function is not, uh, was not entered yet, the library was not entered yet, so it's actually safe uh, to patch this library right now. And after that, we just return. When we return, uh, the, our, our uh, trampoline table will uh, redirect control flow towards our foo function, which we will execute. And whenever it returns, it's going to use the modified uh, return address, which we changed in the ULP entry. And uh, it will go through the ULP exit function. There, uh, we restore the actual return address, the true return address that uh, we saved in the ULP entry. We then set the shadow uh, variable to null. Uh, so now we know that the library is actually being exited. And uh, then we just return, uh, we just jump to whatever value was stored in shadow, and then we have the regular control flow back again. And uh, your, your, your code is executing without actually uh, having a damaged uh, control flow. Uh, something important about this scheme is that that shadow variable and the pending variable, these are TLS. So uh, we, we basically have uh, threads being migrated individually. And uh, this is important because you might have like many threads running. And you might not be able to find the moment where all the threads are outside the library simultaneously. So by doing something like that, you just go migrating thread by thread uh, one by one. And uh, of course, we use uh, ptrace uh, for uh, triggering this patch. So basically, what we do is that we attach to the process that we want to, to patch. We write whatever information we need in the right uh, data structures, and then we just leave the process running and wait for it to patch itself uh, whenever the libraries are, are being entered. Uh, there are some problems to this approach, uh, of course. Uh, first problem are static functions, which actually have their, their addresses uh, leaked. So uh, as, as you have seen, I mean, we, we depend on the dynamic symbol table, and uh, this basically uh, covers all exported functions. And sometimes you might have static functions which will not go into your dynamic symbol table. And if there's a function which is actually exported but that returns the address of that function uh, to outside the library and you, somebody might eventually call it uh, from outside and uh, this is going to be a problem because you're not going to be tracking uh, the context here. So it might be a little problem to, to patch uh, static functions with this specific model. We are already thinking about ways to solve this, maybe emit uh, stubs in the beginning of static functions, but we are not quite sure yet. We're still thinking, and ideas are very welcome. 
Uh, also, stack and patches may require some further improvements. Uh, we don't have a quite uh, support for that yet, mostly because uh, that, that pending state uh, is something a little bit tricky for you to deal with. We, you actually uh, need to uh, write on the, on the padding knobs of functions, and whenever you do that, uh, you're gonna have to, this padding knobs to need to be replaced again uh, by knobs when you uh, patch uh, th that same function again or something like that. So uh, controlling this multiple versions might be an issue. Wh what we are doing currently is like, you just remove the old patch and then you add a new one. You cannot like patch over another patch. Uh, which I think is, is kind of similar to what you do in the kernel, right? And uh, this is what I had for slides. So I would enjoy any kind of <coughs> feedback and I hope you understood. Questions? Yep. Did you try any of the existing mechanisms like RTL? Did you try to reload using uh, any of the RTL D tricks that we already have, trying to override, you know, trying to um, mark the symbols in the library as weak and then trying to see if you can come up with, so, so the, the patch function can provide a stronger definition and by, by default, I think there's support to override functions. You don't have to do anything special. Um, did you try, like for example, um, coming up with, with a technique that doesn't need you to rewrite the library? Uh, okay, uh, we, in, the first, in the first moment, uh, we implemented it completely differently. Our first approach uh, required to, uh, you to actually add, uh, let's say, uh, checkpoints to your source code. And uh, we actually considered this to be non-fit to our requirements because we didn't want to rewrite source code. I mean, it's actually much better for us if we have the tools changed, like uh, we change the compiler, we change the linker, and then we have like an offline editor which goes in the binary, in the binary and fixes the d dynamic symbol table. But uh, this is completely transparent to whoever is writing the code that you want to make patchable. So uh, we, we actually tried a different approach, but uh, we, we thought it would be better to just have tools that uh, fix this for you and, and not requiring uh, programmers to, to actually have to place uh, something inside the source code. Thank you. I mean, does it answer your question? It does. A okay. And what about the mcount approach that the kernel uses? Um, something like a minimalistic ftrace player. You're already genera generating no ops. So if you had, you know, if you could patch those points, you could do something similar to what the kernel does. You mean, uh, but, but I mean, uh, yeah, that, that, that's more or less what we do. I mean, uh, we want to, to patch the, 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 the uh, depending error. Because I mean, if you have two threads, uh, one might be migrated and the other one might not be migrated. So uh, wha what happens is that whenever you rewrite the, the depending ops, you have to verify if that specific thread is already in the new universe or not. So uh, we kind of do the same thing that the kernel does. So basically we redirect control flow towards uh, uh, a function that will verify if this is in the new state or not, and then it will decide uh, which function it's going to execute, if it's going to execute the, the older version or the new version. So it's, it's in this sense, it's quite similar to, to kernel live patching. Uh, David? Yes. So how is this going to interact with some of the control flow enforcement <laughs> technology that's being added? Because if the process, for instance, has been set, and the application is control flow enforced, and you're now going to start redirecting it in the midst of that, it's gonna be at least tricky to uh, uh, yeah, yeah, disable, yeah, I mean, disable. I'm quite aware about control flow, <laughs> control flow integrity and this kind of techniques. I, I actually did a PhD on that. But uh, this is actually going to be a little bit uh, tricky, uh, but we think we might be able to fix that because of uh, because we, we might be able to, to use jumps at some places but there's like one rat, which is when the, when the function returns to the ULP exit function. Mm -hmm. So this is something we, we're not quite clear about how, how we're going to solve. Uh, we thought about that, we were just like living this problem for, for a second stage, but that's definitely a concern. And, and actually an, uh, an interesting thing here is that we already like use, we, we call the variable shadow, but because it's not actual, actually a stack, we just store one return address there and not like old calls. But uh, what's interesting is that, I mean, this address has already been uh, saved somewhere else, so there would not be a way for somebody to mm. do ROP on that specific address. But yeah, I mean, w we might need to figure, figure something out. Any more questions? 
um, does it work when you obtain the when when basically the application uses DL open and DL sim to obtain uh, the symbol from from the library? Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, what what we do? I mean, currently, uh, Lipop itself. So 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 the thing is, Lipop could can be LD preloaded, so we don't really need to link it into into the binary. Just to mention that. And uh, but Lipop actually uses DL open and DL sim to find whatever needs to be patched. So uh, what we do is that uh, when we trace inside the application, we kind of stop the application from running for a while. We redirect control flow of the thread, so of, of a single thread, so it could go through some uh, Lipop uh, routines where it's going to patch itself, where it's going to find whatever it has to find, and it's going to use DL open and DL scene. And there's actually another tricky part here uh, because if you traced inside the application in the moment where it was running DL open or DL scene, then you're gonna have like a deadlock. So uh, because there are like locks that needs to be acquired for using this function. Same goes with malloc, for example. But uh, we, we are currently not using malloc uh, within Lipop. But this this would be a problem. Have you considered using uprobes? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm I'm not aware about that. Sorry. Uh, you can actually set up probes in user space from the kernel, and uh, that guarantees that everything in in user space is stopped. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that might be a nice approach. Currently, we are trying to avoid uh, interacting with the kernel the maximum we can, but it might be the case where we cannot just avoid it. But currently, we're trying to not mess with kernel support or anything. Uh, do you have the code anywhere? Yes, uh, the, the code for Lipop is actually uh, available in the SUSE uh, GitHub organization. So it's github.com slash suze slash lipop. Uh, I apologize, the git is a little bit messy because this thing is very prototype st in, in a very prototype stage, but the latest version is there. It's a little bit different from what I presented because uh, the individual thread migration is not completely done yet. So uh, it, it's curr it currently depends on having all threads outside the library for it to be patchable. But uh, pretty much everything else is there. So the binary uh, rewriting tools, the compiler, uh, the, comp the the linker patches, and and all else. I mean, a lot of stuff is there. Could someone overwrite what Lipulp is doing in the sense that does it allow multiple patches to exist? And a lot of security tools tend to patch similar functions. Can they come in and hurt? what Lipulp is trying to do because they're trying to patch the same functions? Uh, I, I think I did not understand the question. I mean, uh, yeah, coexistence of other patches. Like, can somebody else patch the same binary uh, for security reasons? You know, a lot of security tools will go patch similar functions that you want to patch for live patching. Um, what do they have to do so that their patches can nest with Lipulp? Uh, OK. so. Uh, I mean, if, if they want to use the same structures that Libpop uses, because we, we keep track of whatever's patching, so you can actually revert that if you want, they would need to follow the the API that we have defined there. The API is, is actually quite simple. The data structures are actually quite simple. So uh, another library would just need to have these routines, I, I guess, that reuse these routines from Libpop that write the data structures there and, and then just, just go through. I mean, and Libpop actually makes it quite easy for uh, for being patchable. I mean, and if you are writing like a library and you want to make it uh, patchable, all, all you have to do is to care in the distribution process. So, oh, uh, m my question was more along the coexistence of patches. So, if you had patched a function for, um, if there was already a patch that was applied uh, through some other mechanism, would libpulp keep that patch and nest through it, or would it just throw it away? Uh, okay, so I, I think it would depend on how the other patch was applied. But as long as uh, the other patch does not uh, mess with the with the entry point of the function, then it would be fine. Because I mean, problem is if you patch another f if you patch a function, but it's you are actually changing the 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 prolog, like the padding knobs or something like that. Then uh, yeah, then Lipop will overwrite that at some point, and uh, this might be a problem. Okay, uh, we have one more minute, so maybe one more question. Okay. Easy one, please. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's not. Uh, okay. ha, have you got a demo? 
If I got a demo? Yes. Yes. It's actually good that you asked because I was wondering if somebody would be interested in seeing yeah. this. Okay. No, nice. Ah, you're going to hang for me? Yes. I feel special now. So, uh, what we have here, where's my mouse? Okay. So, uh, I can show. So, uh, basically, uh, I have this, this thing built here. So, uh, I'll just go directly to the RPMs. Oh, they're not here? Oh, crap. Yeah. Where am I? I'm currently, I can't remember what I have install, installed and what I don't have, so I'll just try to reinstall everything. I think this one is already there. Yeah, I'll try the dummy app. It's also already there. So I'll just run, uh, I'm, I'm actually here, what I have is a dummy library with a dumb application using that just to print messages and to try to replace this function which is printing messages. So, uh, as you can see, I just LD preloaded uh, with false. Thanks, by the way. Yes. And now I'll try to. Uh, I'll try to patch this, this code. So I'm pretty sure I did install the live patch before, so. Yeah, sure. So hopefully I won't embarrass myself. Yes, and now we change the, the function there. So uh, actually we, we, we have this whole thing implemented on uh, as in the form of RPM. <coughs> We actually have like some Lua application running behind the, behind the RPM that actually checks all processes which are, which are using the library and the process which are running the library tries to verify if it's already patched or not and then it will uh, verify uh, if, if uh, leap off was loaded or not and if that's the case, I mean, if everything's in the right place then it will uh, apply the patch by call ptrace. There's actually some code written in C that applies the patch so it will just call this uh, C code, which will uh, see trace into the application and do whatever is, is needed. Uh, as you have seen, there's some stuff that needs to be done to make it like clean. I mean, the signals are still showing in the shell, but uh, as I said before, it's quite uh, in the prototype stage. So uh, we are wor working on improving this, and hopefully it's going to be uh, clean and beautiful soon. Okay, so. I think we are done with the time, right, Eugene? Okay, thank you, everyone. If you want to discuss this, I'll be around. I'll be in the pub tonight, so. Thank you.
at PT. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody else did so far. Um, uh, oh, sorry. If y'all would help. Sorry, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, we've uh, found Live Patch uh, really useful. Um, and so, um, you know, I work at Akamai, sorry. Uh, and uh, we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of servers. Uh, we follow the stable kernel. Uh, so for example, uh, right now we're running mostly 4.14. Um, and, you know, we, f we find, you know, live patch really useful for security um, fixes. Um, and we'd like to use it more. Um, but frankly, we have a very small kernel team and um, <coughs> we don't necessarily uh, have the time to, to go through each patch and sort of verify it. Um, I've also spoken with a number of people um, in various, uh, you know, various other companies who are very interested in Live Patch, follow long-term stable, um, and I think would be potentially be interested in um, using Live Patch more. Um, so I th I, 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 I'm hoping <laughs> uh, that there's, um, you know, interest in the community um, in this. Um, and so I also have spoken with people, you know, like for Android, I know, for example, there's even interest because, you know, the live patch module is, pretty, you know, is a lot smaller than, you know, downloading a whole new kernel and rebooting and so forth. Um, so I wanted to kind of go through some of the issues uh, and, you know, I'm sure you guys have really good ideas around, uh, you know, what, what they are and, you know, and, and so forth, assuming there's you know, interest in it. Um, so I also talked a little with Greg Gage about it, and you know, he seemed like um, he would potentially be interested in running um, live patch modules through his test suite. Um, it, you know, if that was something we could provide him. Um, so anyway, uh, I have two slides, so hopefully that's not over the limit. Um, so. All right, so this is just, you know, first of all, you know, how many people are really interested in this? Um, I think there's interest in it. Um, I'm not aware of too much discussion about it. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the um, people have been doing, you know, people get live patch mostly, I think, through, you know, um, like Ubuntu or Red Hat and so forth. Um, so, you know, how much of this can we automate? Do we, you know, um, there's, uh, you know, a bunch of tools, obviously, for creating live patches. Um, one idea was, like, you know, every time there's, like, a stable patch that comes out, you know, could we, you know, um, sort of automatically uh, try, sort of try it out and see, you know, does it need fix-ups or, or whatnot? Um, Testing is obviously a big one. So like I said, Greg Cage said he was sort of interested potentially in testing these. Um, another question I had was around whether we would need, you know, so the stable, you know, uh, Greg releases his kernel and uh, like a lot of the impetus to have live patches to have them be very timely because they're for important security issues. So do, would we need access or if somebody was creating a live patch, would they need access sort of to uh, that information earlier, um, such that the live patch could come out sort of at the same time. Um, there may be some issues around that. Um, and then it's just about sort of which trees we could support. I think also there's certainly patches right now we were talking about, you know, before about stopping the kernel. There's c patches right now that we potentially don't know how to deal with or we will eventually, but right now we can't. So do we say at some point in the patch stream, okay, 
right now, this patch we can't do. Uh, you're on, you know, we're not live patching that. Um, so I don't know, those were some of the issues. I think, you know, it was mostly meant to be a discussion around, um, you know, or, you know, if, if there's other people interested in this. Um, I think, um, you know, we, if, if we could, you know, work together on it, you know, there would be, it, it would certainly benefit us. <laughs> um, so I guess you probably don't want to start with basically um, setting the target of to generate live patch for each and every patch that goes through stable. That's that's a very that's a very high bar <coughs> uh, for start because basically we as a distro we distribute live patches. We have some criteria which patches actually do qualify for live patches, and that's far smaller group than what actually goes to stable. Okay. So we generate live patches only for. Uh, CVE score, what is it, 7 plus, 6, 7 plus, seven plus or data corruption, <coughs> uh, or major stability issue. And even for that, it basically takes um, two people full time, basically. So if, if you would like to generate live patch, because it's, it's, as you've seen from the previous presentation, it's not fully automated yet, it's a lot of manual work. Right. So I think currently, with the current tooling at least we have, Generating live patch for each and every patch contained in stable is not realistic unless you have uh, an army of monkeys doing it, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, in the discussion we had, I think last night or the day before, we were talking about at least um, mm. doing some of the things you mentioned that you do, uh, being able to tag something as live patchable. Um, and I think that largely depends on the stable maintainer. Maybe they could use the same filtering criteria that you have and mark something to the live patch mailing list or CC the live patch mailing list. That would be a good starting point. And then the live patch mailing list or you know another list could decide whether this is live patchable and worth live patching. The second thing is, of course, if the patch is too complex, there's, there's not much to do, in which case for live patch, we may want to do a separate, you know, we may want to do additional work to see if we can come up with a patch in source form that uh, can be posted on the list or a GitHub tree that can be maintained. Um, those might be good starting places, in my opinion. And I think the third thing that we're missing here is the test infrastructure. If we do all of this and we ship it without testing, I think uh, it's going to be disastrous. Right. I think that's a good point that um, we, we, we want to have a good impression of live patch, so we don't want to just throw out patches and then have them not work. Um, so I think that's a good point. Uh, uh, to or regarding testing, uh, yes. uh, a small part of atomic replacement set holds a self-test. Uh, thanks to thanks to Joe from from Red Hat. So it should be upstream soonish. Uh, so I think it's a good starting point. So what I, I kind of missed part of that point. What what self test or, yeah, or, or is it self test for it's live patch? Self test for the live patching infrastructure, but it's not like test for the, for the real live patches. No. Like right. Yeah. So 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 th this is maybe a little bit sch schizophrenic because uh, in upstream there is only uh, only a framework which is in the kernel, and users are somewhere else. Uh, yes, we at SUSE are both uh, framework maintainers and uh, and users, so we provide those live patches as well. I'm not sure if we, as an as an upstream community, want want to do something about by users in a way that we would provide live patches for for trees. I don't know. Because as as Yuri said, it's it takes lot lot of man manpower to to actually prepare those live patches. So, hmm. um, you'd also have to decide: um, Are you going to support when we when we build a live patch? It's specific to a certain build of the kernel, right? So you have to decide: um, You know, which am I going to support every stable kernel release? Like. If, if there's a CVE that comes out, I'm going to fix it for uh, 4.16.1, 4.16.2. Right, what's the starting point? Yeah. yeah. Is that what you're saying? 
Well, you just, you just have to, you know, um, the more kernels you backport the live patch for, there's more things can go wrong, more testing is needed. Right, the, the, I think that's a, a good point and something I thought a little bit about is like, okay, yeah, you have a, a stable patch that's more high priority, but yeah, which ones are you basing it from? And which part of the stream? Um, yeah, how far do you go back? Um, uh, one idea around that was maybe, like we said, some things were not live patchable, and maybe those are sort of the points uh, that sort of limits it a little bit. But um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, one thing would be like, uh, for example, if you're going to have schematic changes, then who's going to be the person who's going to you know, do the changes for the, you know, do the additional changes which are required as such to generate the live patch? So that will be like one complex thing, right? Like if there are going to be like data structure changes or function schematic changes, that would mean that just the CV patch is not suffice. You need to alter the patch. Well, yeah, I think though, so I, that so would be like an additional overhead. Right, so I think that's one of the points is that for a lot of the patches, you know, or I, I would say, I, you guys would know better than me, but um, I'd say, at least in my experience, a lot of the patches don't don't actually need any changes, um, especially in LTS, like because they're smaller. They tend to be smaller targeted fixes. Um, but yeah, that, that that's mostly what the point of this is for: is the ones that do require extra work, um, because otherwise you just sort of, you know, the patch as is sort of works. Um, so I, I I actually would uh, guess that most of them don't actually. Um, at least in my experience, um, don't actually require um, too much extra or any changes. Um, but yeah, that that that's where the I'm trying to get people interested in in doing those more complex ones. <laughs> so, um, how might you envision, I guess, uh, multiple patches? Uh, would we be creating like a like a stream for a particular you know stable kernel? Um, and you could post a patch for one CVE, but then maybe subsequent you know, CVEs end up changing the same function. Therefore, your input patch may have to, you know, accumulate. yeah, accumulate Accumulated fixes. Um, right. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you're repatching the same function, um, yeah, we'd have to define points like like. Right. Um, Josh was saying before where you know where we're patching from. I mean, perhaps um, they serve as kind of a a sample or a model patch for that CVE, and then if you want <coughs> to distribute it for you know whatever release or whatever, it's up to you to then combine the CVE right. fixes. Right, and that sort of happens with LTS now. So a lot of people that are, are on LTS have their own patches already. Okay. So they sort of have to do that integration already. Um, so it's sort of similar in that sense. Oh, that's a good point. Um, so, assuming, let's say, for example, you used kpatch build to do to build your patches, um, just because a patch builds doesn't mean it's uh, safe. So, part of that effort is going to be, you know, analyzing the patches. Somebody, you know, if you get, you need peop, you know, resources basically to to do that effort, the analysis, you know, not just an, and also conversion if if it needs to be converted. For live patching, so. right, uh, right. I think part of the issue here is, you know, there is a lot of work that goes. I think p a, p yeah. a bunch of people said that yeah. there is a lot of work that goes into each patch. Right. Um, so, I, if you know, if there's enough community interest in it, maybe it would work. But well, th th that's the question I would have. So, who's basically? I, I actually don't have a good overview who, who is currently running on LTS. So it's Android probably is one of the users, right? So they might be interested, and who who else? Who would be actually willing and able to contribute manpower to creating the patches is actually using LTS. Right. I don't know. I mean. Right. Well, you know, we can discuss it more, and uh, maybe not. A lot of people aren't in this room, but you know, it can be discussed on the list if. Okay. It sounds like there's some interest um, in it. Yeah, I think we should <laughs> ask on the list. Um, there might be interest, and maybe Linux Foundation could be another source of. Uh, of this input because they, you know, they, we could go to them and ask them for manpower. Right. I feel like you know if we did get to this point, I think it would help. You know, hopefully advance live patch, maybe get more interest in it, advance it more. So, 
uh, hopefully it would help everybody, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just th that I think that what you are going to do is something similar to what does like Alice for Gen 2, because it sounds like you would like to provide live patches for people that basically like... As a service. As a service, like that you will not provide the binaries, but like some way how to convert sources or patches into binary module, which is basically like Gen2 works that basically, you know, I, I guess that you are not going to provide like, uh, because uh, I guess that LTS kernels are not provided as like bin binaries, but as a sources. Right, they're just, yeah, just sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you basically are going to do something like 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 Gen two with the, that with their a life patch uh, approach that just get some like <laughs> patches and then yeah 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 yeah. Okay. yeah 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 so you might be interesting in to do next talk okay okay so uh, anyway it will get much easier with all the automation we work on currently. So then me, we can do something about it. Right, maybe, yeah, I mean, one thought is maybe we're not really ready for it to, 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 to yeah. do that, it's too much. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's too much now. Right, but, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, wh why not? K-patch build yeah. work. Yes. So if you do use K-patch build, that would work. Yeah, we, we so use K-patch build. Okay. Um, so I've used it, yeah, I mean. It's time for a break, so. All right. Hi, I'm Anish Ferrazzi, and I'm working for Cyber Trust Japan. And <coughs> this project is part of a Gen2 kernel project. And today uh, I will talk about uh, LF patch. <coughs> So, LF patch is a flexible uh, framework for live patch, and <coughs> the motivation under LF patch is that some distribution uh, started to have LF patch. Uh, for <coughs> I I usually get stressed when I'm talk. So um, some distribution started to have LF patch for fixing security bugs temporarily and where we can use uh, it on same kernel binary file uh, configuration and GCC version. Uh, in Gen2, we don't have such user case. Every user do practically what they want. They install their own kernel version, they put their own kernel configuration, and they have GCC with different version, in some case, different optimization. <coughs> so, uh, LF patch is trying to simplify and reproduce the system for in such situation. So <coughs> we, are, we also found that uh, there is little support uh, for from live patch service for user case when the user want to send uh, the patch for be converted into a live patch object. <coughs> and you usually just get what the distribution is sending to you. So you need to say to trust your distribution. And because there is no contribution from the user, user doesn't collaborate in, in making this patching creation process. So uh, in some case, this process is uh, closed source. So <coughs> NF patch is trying to solve uh, this process by creating an open source collaborative ecosystem around the live patch when user can collaborate for making uh, into the live patch, li live patch patching creation process. And they could also create uh, their own uh, repository where they can maintain and share the patch each other. <coughs> and, but 
th this system is still uh, experimental. We started to make such things, and now what we are trying to get is, <coughs> is in many in some cases not working, and so we want to get feedback from the user so that we can make it better, and, and so we are trying to get feedback. <coughs> so if you want to try and use, uh, please send feedback. And <coughs> there are still many problems, and one of the problem is that we are trying to make it uh, the live patch process more simple. <coughs> and <coughs> here we are using a kpatch build that is coming in help for automatizing the live patch patching process. <coughs> And we also think that uh, user can collaborate each other for um, <coughs> making this patch. And as now we are also doing uh, about better system reproducibility. Uh, we are reproducing it uh, the kernel, the kernel configuration, and and that's all. And we think in the future to try to, as uh, yesterday was discussed, try to reproduce also same GCC version, and <coughs> to use container for doing making same system of the user, and. <coughs> So, <coughs> uh, uh, another thing that it can be used as patch is for uh, uh, continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment check. So you can send the patch to LF patch and it will check in some system that is working. <coughs> And, <coughs> and because we are making this, we are trying to make this uh, LF patch repository uh <coughs> where user can maintain and collaborate making patch. Uh <coughs> we are thinking if maybe we, we can have someone that is maintaining such repository. Um, yeah, and that's all. Like if there is any question about the left patch, if there is any question about uh, I, I think uh, like today some part was already discussed like for the LTS <coughs> and also for um, uh, with Nikolai system it was for making more simple uh, the way of automatizing the live patch process, and I think it's something that we can see to adopt in the future, or <coughs> I don't know. And now is completely in discussion what we will do in the future, so uh, if there is any idea, anything, okay. I have to throw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi. Uh, okay. So, is your patch system then going to be specific to Gentoo, or could I use it with any distro? Yeah. Uh, as now is uh, unfortunately specific to Gentoo kernel, oh, okay. and so we made some kind of monster. So we take. A Demia machine, we put a Gentoo kernel and we use the left patch, and it was working, but it was not Debian anymore. So, but we are thinking the future to support also such uh, different distributions, so to support also Debian or Ubuntu or Red Hat. And as now, I'm 
we are a few people doing such things, so we don't have so much manpower. So it, it is not done yet. But but it is anyway interesting things to do. Um, is the project and source code available online? And if so, so what is the current state? I guess if you are running Gentoo, okay. um, and then <laughs> for folks who maybe are interested in porting to other distributions, yeah. um, is is that something that uh, you know you would accept pull requests or enhancements on? Yeah, we are completely open about accepting pull requests, and. <clears throat> As now, the status is that there is still many cases where it's not working. So w what we are trying to get is getting feedback for what is, so, so that we can, as now, we are sending sometimes feedback to Kepatch Build, to Kepatch, for uh, <coughs> collaborating each other. And so if we get such feedback, we can try to find a way for helping each other. Yeah. Hello. So what sounds a bit scary to me is that you actually, when you create the live page, then uh, you create by uh, binary div between two kernels that are built like more or less that you try to just like uh, simulate what's, what's on the user system. Yes. So you cannot guarantee that it's really the same and there is always yes. the danger that it might just blow up. I just think if there are some ways to do some, at least some basic check, I s checks, I don't know, for the list of symbols that at least these are the same or some checksum of, of, I don't know if the size is the same or something like this, which might be basically usable maybe even for upstream live patching to be more like error prone. So how does it even work with mod versions? I probably lost the idea somewhere. So how, how can you build a module for a kernel that is built by somebody else somewhere else? Because you wouldn't have the same mod versions set, right? No, w which version? The kernel version? No, the, the, the mod version, because the you can enable Tracking of versions of sim uh, of symbols in the uh -huh. kernel, and then the m extra module built against a uh -huh. different kernel wouldn't load, right? I think the mod versions are the same, if even if you build on two different systems, because it's source based. It's like uses a hash of the function signatures. Systems yes, but configurations can be different, right? Not, I don't well, know. yeah, the config has to be the same. Yeah. The source has to be the same, and. Yeah, this why we are getting uh, the kernel configuration. We are getting the kernel configuration and try to make same kernel configuration as the user. Okay. And kpatch build has several checks to make sure that you have the same version of GCC okay. and same binary. Um, the symbols are in the same order and hmm. um, okay. stuff like that. So. And last thing is <coughs> uh, we are trying to make some kind of standard for keeping patch in repository so that uh, you can send the same patch to the elect patch or I don't know, in the future you can send same uh, you can have same repository for kpatch build or you can have for the Nikolai software and it, it it will get like or is getting the ID upstream for the kernel. <coughs> so as now we are using YAML so if there is any other I don't know so someone suggested to use TOML for keeping but I don't know whatever is okay for me. And so uh, you have the Into the repository, and it will get 
that the pass from the folder because I see that many distribution is doing things in each one is doing things in different way. So it's difficult for us to get pass from each other distribution. So we was thinking about making such things more bit standardized or anyway but you can use the whatever you want and you can get some light patch. And and for getting more collaboration and getting some, some repository with patch because of now but it's not so many around. Right? So we also doesn't have many examples where we can make new patch or where we can change for making better patch. So so what we are trying to do is getting feedback from the user and try to make a community around the life patch system. Um, do you envision the use case to be that Gen 2 kernel developers would be the ones creating, curating the live patches, or do you think that Gen 2 users would want to submit pat patches of their own to this e live patch server? Mm. Uh, sometimes some user in Gen 2 is like, oh, I want to do live patch patch, and they started to investigate how to do such things, and <clears throat> so any that one is one of the help that we can get, and <clears throat> because there is some interest in Gen 2 about creating live patch, but is not only about Gen 2. I think also other distribution can have interest on making live patch. Like <clears throat> there is other distribution that are using live patch, so I think it's not only specific to. Gen 2. <coughs> no? <laughs> it could be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the last question for this. Time's up. Oh, sorry. I have some ba quite basic questions. So, what about the security of your system? Like if someone want to exploit your system and then push malicious code mm -hmm. to all the servers right that are under control, is there any mechanism to protect against? Uh, the point is that uh, every part of the system is open source. So it can be like if someone want to do some check audit or to want to audit the system, he can. or like uh, Authent authentication right? eh? yeah yeah uh, authentic now uh, we are not doing so, like w you can use like for example uh, you, you can add the authentication but i think it's not difficult to add in such feature yeah. do you sign the that was one of the, uh, we are not signing the module, but uh, it came out in the as issue and it's interesting to do such things. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Joe um, from Red Hat and work on the Live Patch project. Um, I brought zero slides today, so I hope I'm over the limit. <laughs> 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 um, and I'm going to talk about um, Live Patch and the S390 architecture. Um, so, just a disclaimer I am by no means an S390 um, expert, but um, when I actually get machines that we have in our lab, uh, when they're available, you know, 
I get to tinker with, with live patch on them. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, maybe two or three things uh, real quick. Um, starting with relocations and then talking about um, the consistency model and then the uh, next steps for supporting S390. Um, so just a quick summary, uh, Jessica, uh, you, who uh, is the module maintainer, um, had started some preliminary work uh, looking at S390 a while back. And uh, I can summarize some of the things that she had discovered and um, what I picked up and continued. Um, so the, the first thing that uh, Jessica found um, when starting to build uh, S390 kernel modules is that uh, GCC can generate um, PC relative 32-bit relocations. And on S390, this is of particular interest because of the way the uh, kernel address space is laid out. Um, what ends up happening is the kernel proper is at one end of the kernel address space, and then the modules are loaded um, on the other side. So what ends up happening uh, when you generate um, at least K patches, and I suspect maybe source base live patches, um, is that you can have um, these 32-bit um, PC relative relocations um, that are put into a, a kernel module that need to get to um, kernel space, and it's too far to traverse for 32 bits. Um, so, um, so what to do? Um, well, luckily, Kpatch and I think the source space uh, tools were already uh, keeping list of relocations that we might need to adjust. Um, so Jessica had uh, brought the problem to the GCC folks, and she lobbied them to um, to port uh, a compile option called M no pick data is text relative. It rolls off the tongue. Um, this uh, essentially addresses um, relocations concerning uh, the relationship between data and text, um, and um, basically turns um, it uh, turns off the relative addressing for those. Um, they ported that from, I think, the ARM architecture to um, the S390 um, architecture in GCC. And I think that made GCC release 8 or 8.1. Um, so it's been there for uh, a little while now. Um, so this solved some of the problem. There still remained an issue um, uh, of local kernel function references. So if you're kernel function, or you have a reference to a kernel function, and then you need to carry that relocation into the kernel module, um, what do you do? Um, so a tentative solution that uh, Jessica and the GCC folks had, had floated, uh, and I had implemented and have been testing a bit, um, is to convert those relocations um, to 32-bit um, redirected uh, relocations. So essentially, um, GCC seems to be generating the same um, with instructions and the same uh, sort of series of instructions um, when it uses either those relative or um, PLT relocations. And so what we just simply did is I, I checked for the, that pattern and then converted the relocations um, to the PLT type. Then when I load it, the, um, the live patch module, the module loader sees those, creates PLTs, and now we have a little trampoline to get here, you know, from here to there. Um, so that's worked fairly well, at least in the, uh, the test cases that Kpatch has. Um, you know, I did not um, exhaustively test it, but um, the tentative solution seems to be holding uh, so far. Um, that said, there, I guess, would be maybe some performance, maybe impacts by having the PLT redirection. Um, but more interestingly, uh, there is some to do here. And I think um, function pointers might throw a wrench into this. Um, I have to do some investigation and to see 
what does it mean if you have function pointers in a similar manner? Can, does it generate the same code? Can we convert them? Can we compare them? What does a function pointer mean if it pointed to patched code versus unpatched code, et cetera? Um, okay. So that was uh, kind of the extent of what Jessica had been doing with GCC uh, module loading. Um, the next part of this um, was the consistency model, and in particular, do we need an uh, OBJ tool for um, S390? Uh, a quick recap, um, I don't have slides, and I'm not gonna go into a long detail about the architecture, but the stack frame is pretty simple. Um, the ABI supplement describes it. Um, the functions are passed new frames by the calling function, um, and they're required if that function is going to in turn call another function. Um, and the stack frame consists of the usual um, sort of register save area, parameters, um, uh, et cetera. And most interestingly, uh, an optional back chain pointer. So the back chain pointer uh, facilitates stack unwinding. Uh, each pointer holds a copy of the previous stack pointer until you get all the way back to the first frame, in which case you have a null back chain uh, value. So it allows you to sort of traverse the stack and um, help unwind. Uh, okay, in looking at uh, the architecture, and uh, I was kind of keyed off by the supplement saying that the back chain pointer is optional. Um, I went about actually testing this and I couldn't find anything architecturally that forced you to use back chain pointers. Um, so I said about writing some really terrible assembly code. Uh, I used GCC to, to make some assembly where function A calls function B calls function C, et cetera. I took the assembly, it generated, and completely removed the stack frames, uh, but left the code intact. and. Um, you know, saved some things in registers. And sure enough, when I traced the execution, I could get all the way through my functions and back. It confused the heck out of GDB, but you know, uh, the machine didn't explode. So it did indeed seem optional, okay. Um, so I told Josh this and he said, well, okay, well, what does the kernel do? Because Joe doesn't write S390 kernel code. <laughs> Um, so GCC does indeed use um, an option, I think it's dash M backchain, something like that. Um, yeah, dash M backchain. Um, so um, we kind of came to the conclusion that, that calls from C code should work because GCC will be doing the right thing. So C code to C code should be fine. Um, calls from inline assembly, um, should probably be fine as well, because if you got there, GCC set up a stack frame, and on the, the callee needs to get its arguments. Um, and if GCC is doing that, then it's probably maintaining uh, this back pointer chain. Uh, so that left us with assembly code. Um, could it potentially forget to store the back chain pointer? Um, so that sounds like something an awful lot like OBJ tool, or a job for an OBJ tool. Um, so short of actually porting OBJ tool, um, S390, um, Josh came up with the suggestion of looking at uh, OBJ dump assembly output um, and sort of inspecting it. Um, and to make matters worse, I think he suggested writing an awk script to do it. And I didn't know if that was a challenge or a dare. Um, <laughs> so, uh, surprisingly, it didn't turn out too bad. I think it's only like 60 lines. It's better than my assembly. Um, so in the end, uh, I, I ran it against a fully um, compiled test configured kernel. Um, there was like over 200,000 functions I think it analyzed, and it came up with about uh, two dozen functions that looked, quote, interesting. Um, where maybe they didn't set up a stack frame and then made a call, um, or didn't save a back pointer and made a call. Um, so the summary of that uh, experiment is that when we looked at those functions, they were all 
um, in init code or um, interrupt handlers or boot code. So essentially, uh, it seemed like the kernel did a very consistent job of maintaining um, the back pointers. Um, so that was kind of the, the extent of what uh, that I've learned with S390. Uh, we presented that or posted upstream, I think, um, maybe a few weeks ago. Um, and Martin from IBM, um, I think the, the Arch maintainer, he um, confirmed the fact that, that back chain pointers were indeed optional. Um, however, they did have a line item to uh, implement the ORC unwinder and also OBJ tool support. Um, and once they had that, they would be dropping support uh, or dropping the M back chain uh, build option. So it would get them a little bit of, of a performance uh, boost. So uh, the question in that I had is that uh, certainly if anybody knows what the timetable is for that work, that would be very good to know. Uh, and then um, if, uh, if we don't know, you know how long that would take, and we do think that back chain uh, use is consistent, then should we just go about enhancing the existing unwinder um, to handle any cases that it currently doesn't? Um, which um, I guess we'd have to make sure function graph tracing, k probes, um, stack corruption, et cetera, um, would be needed. Um, and I guess uh, an additional question might be, um, should we just set about thinking about um, how to make OBJ tool arch architecture independent? That's probably a question for a whole nother micro conference, Josh. But um, uh, so um, that's all I have for 390. And I didn't know if anybody else was interested in live patching for that architecture or had done any similar sort of initial program. Uh, Yes, yeah, so a comment about this is that we are going to be very much interested about it in the future. <laughs> in the future? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the conclusion is that we should be safe and OBJ tool is not needed. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm, right. And we have to only implement that reliable stack traces infrastructure. Is that correct? So detection that the stack trace is reliable, so that no, uh, those weird things like function tracing were happening, right? Right, correct. Correct, thanks. Okay, so what, what about OBJ2? Um, well, we, we, we're pretty sure we don't need OBJ2 for S390, so the question is, um, if they want it for orc and winder, um, they should, they might want to question why they want the orc and winder because I think we did some performance numbers with back chain disabled, right? Um, and so I, I did build a kernel, right, without back chain and, um, I don't, I think I ran stress, the stressor program and I didn't see much of a difference, but, um, of course, uh, I'm not the architecture expert, and I, I'm sure you could concoct, you know, some scenarios where maybe it is more interesting than, than what I did. So there, there might not be as much benefit for the Orc and Winder. So yeah. uh, whether whether OBJ tool would be needed for other reasons, I don't know. No other questions? Just another basic question. So why IBM? Like, I, it sounds like I, the IBM G3, you're talking about G3s, right? The process model talked about, looks like has more demand for this. Is it due to their application domain like requiring high availability? Or do we have similar demands in other server systems, what about mobile? Like, do you see any areas where this may apply? So the question is why S390 and not another architecture? Yeah. Um, 
uh, well, I can't speak for SUSE, but generally um, I would think um, distributions would want to kind of have parity, feature parity. Um, if you offer live patching for architecture A, and then you say, we, you know, we support our distribution on architecture B, one might ask, well, why can't I get a live patch for architecture B? So there um, are uh, other, you know, uh, there's work underway on other architectures. Um, you'll hear from Kamalesh in, in a moment on, on power, for example. Um, you know, I think there's a patch set outstanding for ARM. So, you know, there's a bunch of architectures kind of simultaneously being, being worked. Um, maybe a better, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I, I would say that live patching makes most sense on servers that are not cheap to reboot because they have to, they handle some business important stuff and so of course I guess that x64 uh, is the most common architecture and but S390 also runs probably some of this sensitive stuff and our PC as well, so this is probably why this gets more important. On the other hand, ARM, uh, well, to be honest, I'm not sure, but at least on a mobile phone, it doesn't make much sen sen yeah, sense to. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, it will be interesting, interesting as well, yeah. I think we're out of time, so. I think we're over Thanks. time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, but we do have some ARM people in the house, so we could have a discussion. Yeah. Um, do you want to do you want to talk about this now? Um, ARM for OBJ tool, or. I know you guys had some questions about um, frame pointers and so. Yeah, so I guess the big deal is that um, the ARM64 maintainer, the ARM64 upstream maintainer is basically, we don't know what's necessary for live patching. We don't know what the necessary prerequisites are for things like uh, has reliable stack trace. And after having read the documentation, I'm still not entirely sure. <laughs> um, be really nice if we could improve the documentation on like specifically what in a architecture neutral way what's required because the way it's written at the moment is rather x86 specific at least from my point of view mm -hmm. um, uh, as I understand it there's an awful lot of stuff that we need to do before live patching is ready on arm 64 so we need f trace with regs we need reliable stack tracing we need to go and audit all our assembly with respect to that <coughs> No one's really done the latter two parts of that. Um, I think Torsten Du from SUSE has been looking at doing F-Trace with regs, but has assumed that everything else is fine, and I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, from my limited understanding, um, I think we have an issue with, with frame pointers. Um, um, so some of the issues with frame pointers that we saw in x86 are um, if if you have inline ASM that calls into another function, right? Um, GCC doesn't know what's inside of the inline ASM, has no visibility. So sometimes there's two things that can happen. One is if the function was otherwise a leaf function, then the inline ASM, that will break frame pointers because it, there will be no frame pointer prologue before calling out. The other case is, um, if the inline ASM is inserted before the frame pointer prologue, which we saw happen a lot or dozens of times in x86. Um, so GCC can do that. It can reorder things and do the prologue later after it inserts the inline ASM. And so that's a real problem. So yeah, so we definitely have, um, for our atomics, we have um, inline ASM that doesn't have a line call, which would definitely break 
frame pointers to be don't set up a stack frame for that. We're aware of that case. Um, in terms of GCC doing crazy things, <laughs> take a look at Will Deacon's Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, we've not done any of the auditing necessary to know what's what we need to do there. So, I mean, it sounds like that confirms my view that we do need a OBJ tool for for ARM. Can we start by marking those functions as not patchable? Anything using inline ASM where we know there's no frame pointer, start marking them as not being light patchable. So in this case, this is any function using any of the atomic API, which is going to be the vast majority of functions yeah. that get inline all over the place. So, um, so Ard had a potential solution that reworks the way we do that, but I'm not entirely sure if that helps because it moves the call out into a subsection. It might not get reported as part of that function. Yeah, but we can fix we can fix that in the in the backtracing code. It's yeah. yeah. So big deal is there's work to be done there. Yeah. We need to actually understand and analyze that. So, what other? What, did you have any speci other specific questions, or do you want me to go over? You pretty much gave an overview of the requirements. Like you need F trace with regs, but from a safety perspective, we need um, reliable frame pointers. Is what we just talked about. We also need a um, unwinder that can. Um, what well, we we call it a reliable unwinder. Frame pointers aren't always reliable, even if they're always in the right place. Because when you have um, exceptions like you know, page faults and preemption, then things can get go weird. So um, the unwinder needs to be able to detect those cases. When you have an exception on the stack, um, then it needs to return an error and say this is not reliable. So I guess um, in terms of that, when you say it's unreliable, yeah, because you preempted in the middle of something before you, does it matter if we have duplicate frames in the unwind. Do you actually just care that the, the full set of functions is in the backtrace, or does it literally need to be absolutely correct so that you wouldn't like have the same function twice in the backtrace? Um, duplicates would be fine. You just need to make sure that the function that you're patching is not on the stack trace. So it's part of our consistency model. Um, on, any stack, right? on any stack, on, on any stack. On any, we, we transition one task at a time. So we look, um, we look at the stack of a, of a task, and if, if all the functions that we're patching at that time, if none of them are on, are on the stack, then we will transition that task. So at least in terms of exceptions, we can handle that in the entry assembly because we artificially create a stack frame for the preempted, um, for, for, the, for wherever we took the exception from. So we can create a, f uh, stack frame that would point to that uh, PC value at that point in time, which would be that function. And we probably would have to do some munging of if it's in the middle of creating a stack frame, what we do there. Well, you don't always have to get it 100% right. It's, it's okay to say there's a preemption on the stack. We just won't, don't patch this task right now. So it's not, it's not a big deal. It's a pretty rare case anyway. So. <laughs> ah. So for things like um, tail calls, I guess it doesn't matter if the return address that the stack trace would say is, do, does it matter if we have a false positive pointing at a function that we're being patched? No. No, I mean, false positives, um, it, it's not bad. I mean, you would just skip, you would unnecessarily skip that task. But with a tail call, um, it wouldn't even show, an, show up on the stack trace, which is fine because the function has already basically exited. Yeah, so the, the fun thing is the tail call leads to a false positive in that you point at the next function, the entry point of the next function. Not is where you're, tail call, this is the no return call. Sorry, yeah, no with a no return call, um, say like a branch to panic. I mean, it's a stupid case because it's almost always fatal or a task exiting. It's LR value that will get put into the stack frame. We'll be pointing at whatever's next, which could be another function. We get a false positive out of it. And we can 
fiddle with it. Yeah, that's fine. Then. Okay. I think that the telco function always, uh, yeah, problem, uh, problem, uh, yeah, have a problem on the uh, unwinding check. Even on the x86. Not visible. No, not visible. Because that's a, um, the, the fun usually the, the table will jump to the, the next function so that the, there is no, yeah, no function on that. If there is a chain of multiple jumps that then end up with a final return to the very beginning, then it's completely yeah. invisible to the unwinder, right? That's fine. You know, those functions are basically exited. You don't return back to the Oh, yeah, you're yeah, right. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, sorry. You're yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're over, but I mean. So what, what, what what's the conclusion? We we need a, we need OBJ tool, right, for ARM? I think so. Yeah. Okay. We need to do a lot of preferentry work before we even Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is there is something else on ARM, right? There, there's not FN3, but they have some yeah, other. There's a new, there's a new that process that option. It's called <coughs> minus F fetchable function, I think. So you, and it takes parameters of how many nodes there should be in a prolog. So. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, do you, do you want? Okay. Actually, Camilash is going to say a few words. Yeah, um, you guys finish off my discussion too. Okay. Mic. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I usually find myself really loud. So, <laughs> anyway, so uh, most of the discussion were like it's just a. Uh, uh, I'm not going to discuss the same thing which S390 and uh, um guys discussed. So in PowerPC, for if you're going to see that you know, uh, the back chain is what uh, in the PowerPC terminology we call so that uh, you can just you know unwind or walk through the whole stack to figure out you know from where are you getting or what's the whole call chain is. So that's the reason it was determined that, you know, we don't really need an object tool for uh, enabling the consistency model or the consistency check on PowerPC. So having said that, uh, uh, it was concluded that, you know, uh, by ABI, uh, it is mandated, uh, it is a mandate that we have this, but we, uh, for the 
hand coded AIMS uh, assembly language or the assembly code as such, uh, there is no way we could, you know, uh, uh, be sure that you know it's not doing it. But uh, to guarantee that on Power PC you can't do that. I mean, you can't do. Uh, you have to make sure the frame pointer is set up in the right way, and you know all the rules which apply to the C code applies to the assembly also. So you, you can't guarantee that you know uh, if you're going to do something, things will break very badly. So now the question is like, if in case. Uh, if you're going to have object tool, which is like very nice to have, to just ensure that we are doing things right. Uh, to add up to the discussion, given that we have now S390, which is people are working on, and we have ARM, which people are working on, and if I'm going to do, if, I, if we are going to modify object tool to add PowerPC support, uh, so th that would mean that, as I said, we are going to enforce all the rules which we have for C, and a couple of them which we have for x86, like uh, you want to make sure the stack, uh, the frame pointers are right. I mean, they're set up right. And if you're going to have a jump, you make sure the jump is uh, just, it's a legal one. It's like like not the inline assembly where you just do a, uh, you know, jump, uh, a non-written jump kind of thing. So enforcing those rules will be nice to have on assembly as such through object tool. So that would, uh, the major question here is like, now we are going to, if, if we are going to add support for PowerPC. Isn't it the right time to relook back and start, you know, separating the arc dependent bits and arc independent bits, which would mean that changing the check.c file into like uh, have it as like an arc directory as such, and then we just start putting the bits. I mean, like the common code as well as the yeah. So that that would be the right way to do right. Yeah, that, that was kind of the original intention of how I laid the code out. Um, Check.c was supposed to be common and arch was supposed to be arch, but it was just the first effort, yeah. and I'm sure so that I got a, I missed a lot of things. And so, uh, the, the reason why I'm saying this, like, uh, if I'm just going to pay for a power piece, we can just do the if defs will work. But mm -hmm. given that the number of architectures you are going to add now, it'll be you know the clean way to do is like just have an arc directory. And so arc directory here would mean like uh, from the discussion, I feel that we would need it for the arc as well as for check. Or uh, how are we going to do that? I mean, sorry, say that again. So the uh, arc unwinder because oh, S390 or, okay. or that would need uh, oh. uh, there would be like arc specific bits which will go into that also, and we'll have check which would have be like again arc specific bits. Yeah. So or else uh, should we do it? Uh, let's do the check dot C first for. Start with check.c, where we have the arc separation, and then gradually keep adding things. I'm like, should it? Maybe. I need to look at the code. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, so uh, one thing uh, which would mean uh, adding support for object tool is like identifying the sites where we don't need enforcement. We exactly know that you know what we are doing is right, and it's OK. So that's one exercise which uh, PowerPC would need, uh, especially with the ASIM code as such. And uh, yeah, PowerPC comes with its own things. Um, with my experience uh, with kpatch build, uh, I'm sure uh, there will be certain things which would need some exceptions or certain way of doing things which might change the object tool a little. I don't have anything on top of my head because as if now what I have uh, currently working is like just making sure the frame register state is like perfect. I mean, th that's the point I've reached now. And uh, one thing which I would like to do is like uh, update the documentation on whatever finding which goes on power as such. So the, the major question would be the last one, the compiler independence thing, which so are we going to go the way of using GCC plugin. Because I stopped my work there at the point two, because uh, should we try GCC plugin also? Because this would be like, that's right. Um, yeah, I had a plan to ease um, the OBJ tool port to other arches. Uh, and that plan involved using a compiler plugin. Yeah, then, yeah. Um, uh, Linus happened to be on CC when I mentioned this. And he said, uh -huh. don't do that. Uh, at least for another few years, because okay. um, they, you know there's there's a perception that GCC plugins are aren't um, 
stable yet for oh, certain, okay. maybe for older versions of GCC. So um, I think it's something we should look at um, and it might help this now that all of a sudden we need other architecture support. Um, maybe we could look at it again now. Um, it's yeah. uh, because yeah. uh, I think uh, RTL, just reading the RTL pass and just making sure the annotations are there would ease up a little. Yeah, I think you could use a plugin to um, annotate certain certain important um, parts of control flow, yeah. and um, and so hopefully that would help reduce a lot of the um, architecture specific, specific codes. codes right. And uh, I remember uh, uh, the suggestion which came out as like for different GCC version, and every time there is going to be a different. I mean, the GCC version changes. We have to make certain changes to the object tool as such. So coping up that wood is going to be like one big thing. Yeah, yeah um, it is um, It is a, a pain for OJ tool to keep up with G GCC. And some parts of, some things are especially difficult, like the uh, switch tables. Yes. Um, the OJ tool has a hard time finding those. And so. uh, and I, I can just imagine on par, and I'm sure we're going to have like a power the way it does the switch label uh, from uh, when we analyzing the object code, it does it in a very different fashion. The way the ASM labels get generated, it's going to be like really, really tough for certain situations. So I was just thinking about all those things. But uh, interesting thing would be like, uh, as you mentioned, if you're going to have no optimization or the GCC OL flag, someone I, I don't know who suggested the OL flag. <laughs> if, if that comes in, I'm sure uh, at least it would ease a little of the decoupling of uh, GCC. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, so far, I don't think OBJ tool has had any trouble with those interprocedural optimizations. That said, kpatch build has had a lot of trouble with those. Yeah. So. <laughs> I know it. So it will help there. So uh, one suggestion would be like, uh, uh, as if now when the other architecture is just, they're trying to uh, you know, do the reliable stack trace, uh, it'll be nice if they can even identify uh, the sites which they think is like, can be, you know, uh, is okay if, you know, the object tool, uh, you know, doesn't analyze this particular site kind of thing. So that's something which I I'm not sure if, uh, as part of uh, putting the object tool, they want to do that. Because if, anyways, if you're going to do the arc independent thing, so most of the bits would be there, and so the dead end has always been a problem to identify what will be the tail call or the uh, uh, the end of parsing of uh, or following the different function calls. So uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, Please feel. So I'm just coming up with the questions which I had. Uh, it, it started up last year and uh, now mid December, and uh, we figured out that you know uh, we can reliably walk through the stacks, and we really don't need object tool as such for Power PC. And given that there is an interest now, so if you're going to restart, we are better do it in the way which would like scale for everyone, not just do it for Power. So that's uh, the whole point. Um, is there a way to disable uh, back chain? No, 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 we can't. Okay. So uh, that that was a major question, right? For the, all the questions you asked for, the qu discussion just now you had, uh, that too, that's not possible at all. So we can reliably, uh, you know, say that you know there is going to be a page fault or if there is going to be any uh, uh, exceptions, the exception markers come on the stack. So, so uh, yes, question. So what exactly is this plugin being used for in Obstool? I mean, I, I work on GCC, by the way. So why, and why is this remaining a plugin? I mean, after you've prototyped it, why isn't there now already a process, or is there, or when will there be, to convert this into an actual feature directly in GCC and potentially Clang? Why is this remaining still a plugin? Um, there's no plug-in yet. It was uh, it was a hypothetical. So um, if once we get to that point, well, actually, I guess there is one plug-in. It's yeah, yeah. 
we have it in the key patch. Right, but it's, it's uh, but OBJ tool itself, there's no plugin. But um, it's a valid point that if we, if and when we do get plugins, um, it's a sign that perhaps, you know, that functionality could be moved to GCC. So, so yeah. yeah, not saying just you know move it to move it, but I'm saying plugins are a great way to prototype new functionality. But th this is something that really needs to be maintained in the longer term. That wasn't the intention of plugins and plugins. I mean, I'm not sure exactly the conversation with Lean is, but it's never going to be a stable interface. It's always going to be changing because you're using internal infrastructure, internal APIs in the compiler. So it's not intended to be some sort of a long-term, oh, you'll, this plugin, you compile it once and it'll be usable later. So it's really intended if this is something that's necessary for, uh, I mean, which is a, gr a great feature. I mean, and this is just something that sounds like I mean, there should at least be a plan for, I mean, some either, you know, you know your team or the GCC team and, in, 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 you know, Susie and Red Hat and others, but one, you know, you know planning that this will be uh, implemented or proposed as a feature so we can, st and engaging the GNU toolchain community and the Clang community as well so that we have a well-defined interface that everybody's going to agree upon for how this is going to work, what, you know, having a, you know, a, a really conformant spec for this is after, this, um, it gets prototyped. I mean, it's not a matter of just like, you need to have that on day one, but you know, just understanding that that's the process and not just sort of showing up and saying, well, this sort of works now and we sort of like this and you know, you know, I mean, not that it needs to be this, uh, you know, full language spec, but something that's a little bit defined so that everybody can, you know, can start, um, you know, ag agreeing on it, negotiating on it, understanding whether this is really maintainable in the long term, how this is going to be impacted with, as we were discussing, optimizations of compiler or anything else, just to understand whether it's, it's doable in general, for instance, on multiple architectures. I mean, some things that are just sort of, well, it works on x86, well, yeah, it, it works. I mean, but that doesn't mean it's actually, you know, safe, you know, reliable, it's robust. It's, so, you know, just to, under, you know, again, not, you know, tomorrow we need this, but it's a matter of just, you know, thinking ahead of how this is going to work because this clearly is a functionality that that's going to be necessary and how to, to make this implemented in a robust manner. Fair enough, yeah. Um, as, as we move forward, we'll, we'll engage and um, we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, but uh, to mention it, did, uh, the GCC plugin did uh, solve a major problem for me in uh, PowerPC as such. So what happens is like uh, you have a sibling call and it doesn't need a knob. So the reason being is like uh, the LR restore is not needed. And now when you're building a binary comparison, I mean binary compared way of doing it, that would mean that that function which was a sibling call is now an export. So now how do you insert a knob? I mean you need a knob there and the knob is missing. So GCC plugin did you know, help us there. And, uh, Josh wrote it. So I'm just saying you want practical example, but it it did it, it help. So, so you were thinking if uh, we could just uh, do the same thing with RTL. I mean, passing the same uh, parse and just if we can do it, we could de decouple you know, a lot of uh, uh, GC specific things as such. I mean, that was the idea. Yeah. I, I mean, this I think is the broader problem. I'm not exactly sure what uh, in what forum we want. To discuss it because I mean, so there's this, this K patch, there's there's you know this. I mean, there's just a lot of places where you know it's a it's a trade-off between optimizations and how much the uh, you know the code is really you know modular and really isolated so that one can perform these sorts of replacements. And I'm not sure. And um, I mean, I guess what what. Um, it seems like we, I mean, not, not to like, okay, we need committees and stuff, but like, I mean, I'm not sure, what I haven't heard from all these different conversations throughout this, this entire week is if there really is a single definition that all of these different uses can agree upon, or if we really need, um, I mean, again, you know, balancing performance as well, but if, if we really need to have a separate switch for every single one of these different use cases, that there's something that we, there's a common denominator 
that we can find that that's a balance like okay this needs IPA this doesn't need IPA this needs inlining this doesn't need inlining this needs you know no you know no sibling calls with simply I mean it's like how many of these different it's, it's gonna be a very complicated matrix I mean it's possible but I don't think anybody is really at least it doesn't sound like anybody has done that full um, analysis again I'm not sure who but but of you know really deciding if this this level of granularity of differentiation for each of these different cases is necessary, or it's just sort of again, well, this is what we found was a problem for x86, and this is a problem we found, and then, and there's without any real sort of coming to a you know a common denominator, and so I think that. Well, I think there's been some effort towards um, having a single um, GCC flag for disabling those intra um, intra object optimizations yeah. so um, this thing that we have the GCC plugin for um, for inserting the knobs mm -hmm. maybe that could also be moved into that same flag yeah. so so yeah uh, that's a discussion I wanted to have and yeah thank you <laughs>